Once more, um, I'm going to invite Jim up to uh, do an extract. And while I do that, actually, I'm going to ho hope he doesn't mind. I'm going to hand round the horse lips book so that you can identify him and guess who he is on the front cover. Which hairy beast? Exactly. <laughs> Shuffling towards Bethlehem to be born. So I'll start, I'll start at this end, and you can guess which one Jim is. How's that? Thank you guys for that gratuitous plug for the Horselips biography. <laughs> Tall Tales by Mark Cunningham, 20, 20 odd quid in all good bookshops now. <clears throat> um, this extract's called The Rhythm and Blues Boom. Try saying that after 14 pints. 1963 was a breakthrough year for two musical movements in Britain. Mersey Beat, on the back of the Beatles success, and Rhythm and Blues, or R&B, which began as a London phenomenon and within a year had delivered several acts into the pop charts while almost single-handedly wiping out Britain's trad jazz clubs and putting many of its modern jazz musicians in an even more precarious position than they had been before. Some modern jazz players embraced the new R&B sound and hoped it would make them wealthy. The Graham Bond trio, formed in February 1963, featured three people who thought this way. Graham on organ and saxophone, Jack Bruce on bass, and Ginger Baker on drums. Within two months, John McLaughlin had joined. Within six months, Ginger had fired him, which is a far more a reflection on Ginger's personality than John's musicianship. <clears throat> While Graham Bond himself never achieved mainstream success, Jack and Ginger did as members of Cream three years later. While John kept his powder dry until the early 70s. Graham, nevertheless, through force of personality, and the ownership of a second-hand ambulance and a road map, effectively created the British touring circuit, which every act with a transit van took for granted for the next 10 or 20 years. He also gave the world the earliest known recordings uh, to feature John McLaughlin, though none were released at the time. This is an extract from chapter four of Bathed in Lightning. Graham Bond's vision was in the vanguard of what was steadily, by stealth, becoming a national phenomenon. I don't claim we do R&B at all. Other people have given us the tag, he had explained in March 1963. But this is really a new thing, a British thing. Graham, however, was more than happy to attach himself to a passing bandwagon. Uh, as would be the case with a perceived move to psychedelia later in the decade, his music would remain exactly the same. He would just play it with the addition of a kaftan and a silly hat. Fascination with the idea of R&B and an obsession with trying to define it would provide hours of fun over the next few years for music writers and the people they interviewed. Well, what is R&B? Was the headline of a Melody Maker feature by Bob Dawbarn in March 1963. R&B is what jazz men call rock and roll and rockers call jazz, Bob suggested. He solicited further aphorisms from people involved in music. More voltage than vintage was one. Rock and roll with beards was another. Over at Jazz Journal, a monthly British jazz publication, which appeared to do its best to ignore British jazz, the editorial line was both patronizing and utopian. The vogue for rhythm and blues, rock and roll, call it what you will, is but a pacemaker for that horrific beat music, declared a spokesman for the status quo. As with the trad jazz groups who used to pester our ears, the new R&B bands today play a kind of bastardized blues which is performed with more spirit than actual know-how. But I, for one, hold out hope that a feeling for this music may stimulate a taste for the genuine article. Not all of Jazz Journal's readership were even that tolerant. Over on the letters page in the same issue, a Mr. Knight in Hitchin was retreating to his stand castle and pulling up the drawbridge. Dear Sir, a little over two years ago, I stopped reading Melody Maker for almost the same reasons I am now cancelling my subscription to Jazz Journal. I ask you, what has Chuck Berry to do with real jazz? It will be the Beatles and Rolling Stones next. The second half of 1963 would see the emergence on the live scene of key R&B acts, Manfred Mann, The Pretty Things, and guitarist Eric Clapton joining the Yardbirds. The animals were flying the flag up in Newcastle, John Mayall relocated from Manchester to London to form the first version of an endless series of blues breakers. 
Georgie Fame and the Blue Flames continued their inexorable path towards the cumulative limit of gigs per week. And both the Rolling Stones and Cyril Davis' new band, the R&B All-Stars, performed amidst the big hitters of the fast-fading trad jazz scene at the National Jazz Festival in August. The Stones even managed to crack the mainstream with their first two singles and appearances on TV pop shows. Mersey Beat was still the big pop noise of the moment, but hits from many of the Rolling Stones' fellow travellers from the mostly London-based R&B world would soon start flowing. As patently and self-assuredly the best of the bunch, it was natural that Graham Bond would see his own success as inevitable. By April 1984, sorry, <laughs> by April 1964, confident that his readers had by now a fair idea of what R&B was, Bob Dawbarn could announce a, quote, massive swing to R&B, unquote. R&B is the London sound, he declared, and it's spreading. His research indicated that within a 40-mile radius of London, an estimated 300,000 people were paying to hear R&B each week, that there were circa 300 R&B groups in the UK, 140 of which were in London, that R&B was generating around £750,000 in business per week and rising, and that in one impressive example, London band The Yardbirds were working seven nights a week, were booked up three months in advance, and were still a month away from even having a record released. Six months later, Bob had still more stunning revelations. I would estimate the number of R&B groups in Britain at over 2,000, he declared, but I doubt if even 20 of these have anything very original to offer. <laughs> Later that month, in a piece headlined Bored Man, Bob could report the view from the front line in the shape of Manfred Mann leader Manfred Mann. I'm bored with the whole thing, said Manfred, with the endless idiotic arguments about rhythm and blues. As a subject, it is now just a huge bore. I don't feel anybody knows what it is anymore, said Graham Nash of the Hollies. There are basically only eight notes, so what more can you do with them? Perhaps the most profound observation on Britain's brief obsession with rhythm and blues had come from one man who, like Graham Bond, was never destined to crack the hit parade. Mike Cotton, of the otherwise forgotten Mike Cotton Sound. He had been asked where R&B ended and pop began. He had replied, perhaps with a sang note of regret, in Brian Epstein's office. <laughs> 